archives of Prasar Bharti presents the timeless treasure of golden era. One of your most remarkable films, Bhuvan Shom, which is universally appreciated and liked even after so many years, after 30 years, was made in Hindi. Any particular reason why did you choose that language? Because, you know, it was made with the money coming from a film finance corporation, which later on became NFDC. So I had many things to do there. That was the first film where the applicant didn't have to produce a guarantor, no collateral security, nothing of the kind. No, I didn't have to write a complete script. These are the things and many more things. And besides my friend, without whom I could not have made this film, I mean, Orun Kaur, who just literally, I was passing through Bombay. I was to go to Pune. And I went to Orun Kaur's office. He now lives in Delhi. He threw me into a room. He locked me up there. I said, stay there as long as you cannot come out with a script. A small script will do. So I was there, I knew you will be supplied as many cups of tea as you like. So I had three or four gallons of tea. And I was there for quite some time, four or five hours, and I completely, I wrote a eight line, I mean, synopsis of the script, what I would do. As a matter of fact, I was trying with the idea of making a film on this for quite a long time, but I knew that I would not be getting any producer, any money backer. And then I gave it to him, but he said to Minalda, you have to make this film in Hindi, otherwise you won't get it. So. All that was done. That was the first film where no guarantee was needed. That was the first film where no big stars was needed. That was the first film where many more things were done. That was the first film which was much less than the stipulated length which they decided they would, it would be. And when the film was made and they liked it very much, they, the secretary showed me the agreement. It was a 36-page agreement. I, I read four pages and I was convinced that very soon I have to go to jail. Taking government money and making a film, <laughs> there were so many constraints there. I didn't have the courage to go further about it. I went to the last page. I signed this. I got the money, 1,50,000 rupees, and I made the film. It was made with 1,50,000 rupees. And then it was on page 30. It was written there. But they liked the film very much. It was written there that the film, minimum length of the film has to be 13,000 feet, but my film was only 9,600 feet. Even today, I think this is the shortest Hindi film ever made. And then what I said, I said, uh, you shouldn't have any problem. Why don't you go to Delhi and get it amended? And it was amended immediately by, the, by Delhi. And then after that, you know, nowhere in the agreements to follow, even now, today, there is not, that clause has been taken out. Because what do they want? The quality or the length? The only thing, and I thought that let me have a try in Hindi. Everybody was new. I was new to Hindi. Utpal was very new to Hindi. And the girl who acted, he had no experience neither on stage nor in film. And the music director, he was also very new in feature film. And then the cameraman, he was the first time he was in feature film and the first perhaps first film institute boy to have been given a chance to make a feature film, Mahajan. This film, Bhuvan Shum, is recognized as the one that ushered in the new wave cinema. What is your view about new wave cinema? And Because you have been attached to this that type because of film. Because that violates all the rules, all the canons of cinema, the way it was made. Yes. You know, that the most important is the to remain austere. Austerity was the thing that was something unknown in the history of cinema. Because the establishment is always there to tell you that filmmaking is a very expensive job and, and uh, it is our monopoly, nobody else's business. And our job was to show that filmmaking is not as expensive as you think it is. And it is nobody's monopoly, it is everybody's job. And Bhuvan Shum possibly proved it. You are also told you are generally regarded as also the father of political cinema in India. Would you accept that also? Well, they say that and some people say, no, it is not that. Political cinema cannot be made in India. As if political cinema means you have to make subversive films. I don't understand this. So these are the things which keep on going. But then some people feel that uh, I started it. 
I reacted politically to certain things, and I was at that time when there was a lot of anger in the air in Calcutta, a lot of unrest in the air, and I couldn't escape all this. And this, all this happened after Bhuvan Shum, yes, mind you. And then uh, I felt I'm doing no wrong if I, if the film, if my films are marked by blatancy, a bit of blatancy. So I say blatancy in a very positive sense. I was not ashamed of being called a pamphleteer, as long as pamphlet is pays in many ways, as long as pamphleteering is artistically and valid, emotionally very valid, I don't mind. And it has happened to my those films. The at way it has been received by people. At one time, you used to call yourself agent provocator. Well, yes, I am an agent provocator. That way, everybody is an agent provocator in his or her way. Even Tagore is an agent provocator, isn't he? So, no, About one second, you are coming back to Calcutta, your Calcutta trilogy of the 70s. Yeah. Did you try to catch the mood of the city or was well, it something course, more than that? Of course that, but then Calcutta, even though it is called Calcutta Trilogy, it could happen anywhere in any part of the third world. Any city, any metropolitan city in the third world, it could happen anywhere. That is what not only that I feel, but my friends in the third world countries also, they feel the same about it. And uh, the same kind of situation that exists in the third world countries and I have used some of the materials also. For instance, in Padatik, the third of the Op Calcutta trilogy, there also, you know, I used Solanas and uh, African movement, and then uh, Vietnamese. These are the things I used them. And I found some, and in Bangladesh, the war in Bangladesh, that was also used to some extent. I'm sorry I couldn't get the very good shots from Bangladesh because because the man who promised he would give me some shots. He uh, filmed quite a large footage of that. That was Jahi Rahan. Yes. He was killed. He promised that he would do that. And he went back to, he came to Calcutta, I asked him whether I could get it. He said yes. But then he went back and he was killed. So were you thinking of a global cinema at that time? Global cinema, in a sense, that was in my thinking, that was in my making, right from the beginning. I told you when I came to Calcutta, I wish I could tell people that I happen to be a member of the international, yes, I am a citizen of the world, if I could say that. And then again, when they talk about Indianness, about Indianness, about the roots and all, I think we are talking too much about it it doesn't need to argue that I happen to be the son of my parents. Whether I happen to be an illegal son, that is another matter. That is to be decided by the court of law and my, by my parents. But then, that I happen to be the son of my parents who are Indians, who were Indians and I am also an Indian, need not be said in that term. It is very much in me. And that reminds me of, for instance, the Romeo. Romeo, he went to an apothecary. He went to an apothecary and says, could you tell me in what part of my anatomy Juliet lies so that I can tear it off? So that like Juliet, my culture is so much in my anatomy, it, I cannot tear it off. So it is like that. So, and then whatever I do, we are living in a kind of hybrid culture today. I remember, then again, I have to tell you another story. Please. So it was many years ago, my son is now about 42, and he was um, six years old at that time, very average student, average boy, averagely intelligent. He and I, we were sitting, that was many years ago, six years old. He and I, we were sitting in a Calcutta park. It was summertime, and then the sky was very cloudy. It was soon to rain in the evening and we call it Norwester. It comes suddenly, a storm, stays for 15 minutes. All that were settled were unsettled, and it goes off. We call it Norwester, Kal Boishaki. So suddenly, before that, there was lightning. My son and I, we were together, and my son exclaimed, said, look, big, very long stretch of lightning. It covered from east to west, it was like that. 
on the western sky. It covered north and south. It was very big and I got scared and it was followed by the rumbling sound. And then my son looked at it and said, look, it is like 70 millimeter screen. And incidentally, just seven days before that, my son and I, six year old my son was, we went to see a film, 70 millimeter screen film. That was my first experience with 70 millimeter screen. It was his experience also, perhaps with cinema. It was 70 millimeter screen. Or maybe he saw 60 millimeter, 35 millimeter screen films before that. He said, look, it is like 70 millimeter screen. So my, immediately I realized that my grandfather, in a similar situation at the age of six, would perhaps say, look, it is like Jotayu taking to his, to his wings. Or a Muslim grandfather in a similar age, in a similar situation at the age of six, would have said, look, Zibrail has taken to wings. But my son, being a product of science and technology, which unifies the whole world, he speaks in a language which is not bound by any geographical boundary, which is not restricted by any geographical boundary. He speaks a vocabulary which is international and which is the product of science and technology. That is why I say that you cannot afford to be non-global. You have to go the global way. This is what I feel. But still you remain Indian. This you can't sort of, you don't have to make big speeches on that. And sooner or later, with the growth, with the tremendous growth of science and technology, this talk about and the argument about the Indianness and the this roots and all will be perhaps an exercise in futility. Exercise in futility. You can charge me with internationalism, cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism, but do whatever you like, but this is what I feel I am, I believe in. It was all after Calcutta Trilogy, you went back to the village to the rural themes for a couple of movies, yes. like Megaya. But that was the end of it. After that, you become a permanent city bred filmmaker. After started. that, after... Parashuram onwards. Now I feel that film. how could I make such films in the villages, rural areas? Because I now feel that I am an outsider. For that matter, most of our writers and most of our creative workers are outsiders. Creative writers who are based in the city, they are all outsiders where 75%, more than 75% of the constituencies are rural-based. Am I not speaking the language of the metropolitan milieu? We are doing that. And my son, when he said 70 millimeter screen, it is very, very acceptable to the city people and also to you know, semi-urban people. But even now, if you go to the interiors of the villages, the 70 millimeter screen will not make anything to them. You have to use some you have to come to some mythical bard or mythical something. Maybe not now, because with the now that television has made inroads, it is like that. So now I feel that how is it that I made films in rural, among the rural people, rural folk, and about the rural situations. But then later on, I could realize that quite a number of my films, you know, whenever invaded a village with my camera and equipment and uh, my technicians and my actors, I had always a character who is city-bred. For instance, Bhuvan Shum. I always followed Bhuvan Shum, a city-bred man. And whatever he saw, the camera could also see. And I also saw as a filmmaker. And then Akalesh Sandani. It was also, it was on 7th of September, 1980, a film unit headed by a film director, they went to a village. They invaded a village to make a film about a famine that took place in 1943. So there also, I followed the group of filmmakers. So this way, I have done some other films also like this. But then I feel that uh, to make a film on the rural setup is extremely difficult for the people like us. And we remain outsiders even today. I've seen, I have been, when I read this story, for instance, in. Prem Chand. I have been told I don't read Hindi because I can't read Hindi. But uh, Prem Chand's son, Amrit Rai, told me that, do you know Mrinal, my father never used a dialect. He used plain, simple lines for the actors, put them into the characters. But then 
because he used to feel, and he told me, this is what Amrishai told me, that he feels that the moment you have the dialect, the, the reader will have some problem. He will, initially, he was reading at a certain speed. Suddenly, the speed will be less. Yes. To we, understand this. It will be directed to one particular segment of the readers, not to everyone. Don't you think it will only impress one particular segment of the readers, not all his readers? The, most of the readers will do that because when you write a story, for that matter, we know, when even Premchand wrote a story, he wrote about them, about the rural, I mean, the poorest of the poor people, but not for them, certainly not for them. Certainly. So that is why it doesn't go to them. It, doesn't, it, it may not be difficult for them to understand, but for whom he writes his stories, they will have some problem. But then our city-bred writers, what they will do? They don't need to study much about the rural setup. But what do they do? They write a story using their own understanding of the village life, their own understanding of the village life, which by and large is determined by his lifestyle in the city. Okay, and then he uses the dialect. Dialects are very much found these days in, at least in Bengali literature, I have seen dialects are seen like that. But then what Prem Chand used to do, I have read his English translations, I have seen that. that the postures of the characters, the movement of the characters are so beautifully done. And uh, whenever I went to the village, I could see exactly the same. I don't have to do anything about it. I see everything in Prem Chand's story, which means he was so respectful, Prem Chand, when he was writing about these people, he was so respectful about these people. That was why it was so. I remember when I was making this film. Okarika. No, before that, this Mrigaya about the Santals, the tribals. I got in touch with the head of the Anthropological Survey of India in Calcutta. So he was a very, very important man, Shurujit Sinha, who was also yes. the Vice Chancellor of Vishwabharati. I asked him to get me in touch with somebody who has worked in that place. So one of his students who has done his PhD on the tribals, on the Santals, he worked in that particular area where I am to work. He told me a lot about them. He helped me a lot. I was very much helped. He was very helpful to me, that gentleman. He was there for 17 years, you know. And then one day I asked him, now could you tell me, do they clap their hands in ecstasy? Do they clap? He kept quiet for some time and said, well, 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 in that case, I'm a social anthropologist. I never worked on it. To know that you have to go to a physical anthropologist if they clap. This is something stupid, <laughs> you know. Then immediately I went to my friend, the chief of the Anthropological Society. I said, this is what he says. I said, this is all stupid. This is what we people do, you know. But then we, all these pass. Why? Because we make our products available to only to them who are city bred. Even when Prem Chand writes his story, he doesn't write for his characters. Mostly, he writes for the other people who can read and write. That's also must be true for new wave <laughs> cinema also. Okay. Now, after Calcutta Trilogy, I think we should come to what some of your uh, critics and analysts have called the Absent Trilogy. Yes. The film about the middle class life of Calcutta. After that, there are three films. Somebody is writing the scripts. I mean, recreating the scripts of mine, three of my scripts. And uh, like Trilogy or Quartet, he also found absent trilogy in three of my films, made in a span of 10 years. A friend of mine called Jutsi, a psychoanalyst, practicing in London, he decided to write, I mean, to recreate my scripts, three of my scripts. One made in 1979, that is... Agdin Protidin, A Day Like Any Other. It was made in 1979 in Bengali. Then in 1982, 1979, and then in 1982, three years later, I made another film called Kharij. The case is closed, also in Bengali. And then in 1989, I made a film called Achanak, Agdin Achanak. In the first film, the woman, the sole breadwinner in a family, 25, 26 year old, she didn't come home that night. 
So she was absent temporarily. In the other film in Courage, which I made in 1982, you see the, it starts with the death of a young boy, the servant boy of the house. He died of carbon monoxide gas poisoning in the kitchen. So he was absent forever. And uh, in 79 in Agdin Pratidin, that was the beginning of the film. This is how the film starts with. And the second one, this film starts with the death of the boy, servant boy. He was found dead in the kitchen. The third one, Agdin Achana, it starts with the man, the head of the family, now retired. He just leaves the house unprovoked. There was no fight between the husband and wife or the children or the father. But then he just quietly leaves the house, doesn't come back. And it remains undefined whether he will come back or not. So these are, I mean, in terms of situations, you do not find these commonalities. But other than that, he found, that psychoanalyst found, that this is very important. How these three films, even made in a span of 10 years, but in between, uh, you films. have made so many films. But then how these three films, you find a lot of things very common in three films. So he calls it absent trilogy. It, uh, this book is likely to be released, say, by the end of this year, by Siegel. That's a really interesting theory. I think this is very interesting. And then he gave me the introduction. Introduction will be about 40-page introduction, marvelous introduction. What is his interpretation? He had a lot of interpretations to everything, I said, a lot of things. And I found this whole thing very, very interesting. You have to read it to know how it is like. And then when I read it, I told him he was there in, he saw me in Italy, in Naples, when my retrospective was taking place, only about a fortnight ago. And I said it is almost like almost like reading Barnard Shaw's introductions. It is like Barnard Shaw's prefaces. You can't do without the prefaces. In the same way you can't do, you can't read the scripts without reading the introduction. 40 page introduction, remarkable introduction. He made a very, very beautiful study of the whole thing. Not that you have to agree with him all the time, doesn't yes. matter. But he excites the debate. But I have always found Igdina Chanak slightly autobiographical. As far as you are concerned, I thought you had yes. looked at you, a very hard look at yourself. Very Someone also asked look. me in Venice when it was shown in the press conference, to, he asked me to what extent your films are autobiographical. I said, I breathe in every scene, that much I can tell you. But physically, to what extent uh, my films are autobiographical, I can't say. But as we have said in our discussions today, that... Um, there are many things I found in common. I just couldn't, for instance, my letter to my wife, which I wrote from this location in Akaleshandane. I wrote it in the middle of the night. So there also you see that nothing is lost. The life is very strange. Art is also strange, stranger than fiction. There is one very novel experience, experiment of yours. I don't know whether you would like to talk about it. I'm talking about Genesis. It was something which no Indian filmmaker had ever tried. Well, because very few Indian filmmakers could get money from outside to make the films here, four countries were involved. Originally, it was to be between India and France within the framework of an agreement that was signed by French government and Indian government. But then finally, we could see that two other countries also walked in. One was um, Switzerland. Switzerland, another was Belgium. Belgium. The four countries walked in. So the film, but I said that I have to make the film in Hindi. Will you allow me? The author of this agreement was, as a matter of fact, was the then cultural minister of France, France. Jack Long, who was a friend of mine. And I said, would you mind if I make this film in an Indian language? He said, you have to have a word with President Mitterrand. So I was invited there for another something else to attend a colloquium which he, Mitterrand, organized where a lot of people from different parts of the world were invited. So I was also invited from India. So there I could meet him. I said, could I make the film in Indian language? Which Indian language you want to make it in? I said, say Hindi. 
well, go ahead, no problem. And then I had, normally when you have co-production, you have actors from both the countries. And normally when you have any co-production, you have to shoot in both the two countries. But I shot the entire film that was unique of its kind. I shot the entire film in India, in Rajasthan. And I had only four actors in the film, all are Indians. That was how it was done and that was allowed. And uh, my cameraman was French. My recordist was Belgian. My editor was Swiss. And then the whole thing, after the film was shot, the whole thing, post-production work was all done in Europe, partly Belgium, partly in France. Now, what happened? Indian money cannot be used outside India. So, and uh, Belgian money also didn't want to spend outside Belgium. And uh, the French money, part of the money could be used anywhere and also for the shooting and rest of the money has to be used in uh, France. But Switzerland was the most generous. Switzerland said that you can use most of the, all the money outside Switzerland. All that you have to do, you have to have a Swiss uh, editor. So that was how the film was made. And I had absolutely no problem. Normally what happens, as I told you, when we go to shoot on locations, we work for seven days a week. And we work for 10 to 12, 14 hours. But in Europe, they make it a point. Always, everywhere in Europe. And also possibly in America, I don't know. Must be so. They work only for five days a week. And do not work for more than eight hours. But in my case, they work for the way I do. 12 hours, 10 hours. And then also, they work for seven days a week. That was how the film was made. And that was how, after the shooting was done, it was edited partly in Belgium, partly in uh, France. So I had to commute between Brussels and Paris a number of times. And then the mixing was done there in Belgium. It was that the mixing recordist was French. And then finally, the film was printed in France. And then unfortunately, it didn't find any release in, in India for the simple reason the producer played a trick with me. So I don't know, he's untraceable now. Untraceable and I don't know what is going to happen to it. The negatives are with him. I mean the duplicate negatives, but the original negatives are in France. But it was shown in, in France it was released in seven theatres at a time. One big theatre and other small theatres. I know, everywhere else. That's all I can tell you about. It was a very peculiar experience I had with the film. Were you happy at the end of it? Well, as I told you earlier, I'm very happy and I'm also, I wish I could do it over again, I feel. This is the same thing about my life. I wish I could start my life over again. I'm more interested than your philosophy of life, something about your aesthetic perceptions. Because there is a feeling that you are changing, your films are getting more internal yes. than what it used to be. Or maybe, should I say, more esoteric? Esoteric. Do you accept that? Well, it depends. That's true. More and more, I'm de-emphasizing the plots and the incidents. I'm working primarily these days on feelings. Because previously, when I came to cinema, I was told by my predecessors that Film has to be full of incidents. One incident giving rise to another, that to another, that to another. This way, you have to weave a garland. And that is the script. But now, this very moment, I feel it is not that. And this is what I have tried to do in many ways than one. That uh, de-emphasize the plots and the incidents and dwell primarily on feelings if you can do that, nothing like it. And I think that what India needs today is Indian cinema needs today for the experimenters like me, you know, for those who want to go beyond the limit. You know, the point is to do something, you know, to see that the, the language of cinema so far has been oversaturated. 
the language needs to change. I wish I can do it in my next film. Changing the language, having a new language to talk about, it sounds very big. It's a very big claim, very, very lofty claim. But let me see if I can do it. And that, I will be the happiest man under the sun if I can do it. That brings the million dollar question. For the first time in your life, you are silent for more than five years. When are we coming up with your next film? Maybe tomorrow, from tomorrow. Maybe after a couple of years. But then I know how old I am. I know. Even though I'm trying to remain very youthful, I am in more than one way. And uh, I don't think at times I feel that, uh, could it be that my neuron cells have decayed, that I can't think anymore? I don't think it is that. I am reacting, I am responding to situations around me. If I can do that very instantly and very courageously, there is no reason why I cannot find a new language for the film. If I can do that, nothing like it. That perhaps is why I am taking a bit of time. Let it come. Every day in the morning I wake up and find, feel that this time possibly I am going to hit the bullseye. And in the last four or five years, I have written so many scripts, not the full. And scripts don't mean much to me, but then at least I know where do I stand. I wrote quite a lot, then decided not to go in for that. I should do something else. This is how things are going. Anyway, let me see. Keep on hoping, and I'm also hoping that something beyond, a, just around the bend, there is something. This is what I started with. I and my friends started with in the beginning. Nothing could throw us into total disappointments. But we knew that something would come up. Maybe something will come up. One last question, Rinalda. For the last one year, you are having a new role as a member of the Rajya Sabha. What has been your experience? Well, I have been nominated a member of the Rajya Sabha by the President. This is a poetic injustice, I would say. <laughs> because I am not cut out for that. Poetic injustice. I am not cut out for that. But then, how many days I have attended? I get a kind of vicarious pleasure when, during the question, our session, one, just one hour, when I see that the high-ups, their wings are chopped off mercilessly by the other parties. This is what I enjoy very much, but that's about all. And then it's a strange world and I have to know all about it. Many people ask me, why don't you make a statement, a maiden speech? I said, everything will come after a, after a year. And I attended so far, I, one day I told a very eminent parliamentarian. He is in the parliament for long, long years. I asked him, I don't mind being non-collegiate, but tell me, how many days I have to attend to be discollegiate? He said, none. You don't attend one single session. So, I know I was here for two, three days, three, four days, and I'm going back now. Today also someone said, you are an outsider. You are an intruder here, when I walked in. He was joking with me, you are an intruder here. I said, you need aggressive infiltration to bring about a revolution, don't you? And in cinema also, we had aggressive outsiders doing an aggressive infiltration. That was Shatujit Rai and his intrepid band of workers. They made an aggressive infiltration, so that is how I will also made, make an aggressive infiltration one day. Maybe not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rinalda.